Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Magical Learning Podcast for this week. Uh, I'm Jez FM, our host, and this is actually the 201st episode we're recording. I know that this will be like episode 203 or so, but just be aware, we've done the 200. We're into our next 200 as of today, which is very exciting. Um, so I think what better way to start off than to do what we usually do and check in with our regular team. So, John, you were on first today. So, John, what is your week been like this week? Uh, fairly, fairly busy with work, um, but cold here in Canberra. So we're starting to hit winter, which is not fun. Um, bring back summer any day of the week, mate. Right? <laughs> you picked a, a good spot to stay if you like uh, warm weather there, John Canberra. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Got to move north. <laughs> well, it's so good to have you on again, John. Uh, always a pleasure. Um, I might throw to Danette. Danette, how's your week going? Different background this week. What's going on? I'm at Leggers today. So I actually escaped Canberra this morning um, on the 6 a.m. flight and am in Melbourne now, uh, where it is also cold and a bit wet. But I um, went and saw the full guy last night um, and with Ryan Gosling, which is a new movie. Actually, really good. Really enjoyed it. First couple of minutes was a little bit slow, but then it actually was really good. So if you're looking for a movie to go to, not a bad one. Well, I love it. And a, good, a harsh review there of the first couple of minutes. Starts out slow. The first few minutes come in late. <laughs> <laughs> go get yourself a chock top after the uh, trailers are done, I think. Um, good one there, Danette. And Anna, a returning guest. How are you going this week? Well, I know I don't want to like follow the theme, but feeling cold today after a beautiful weekend in Melbourne, that's for sure. Um, but yes, like we've got to start battering down the hatches and getting prepared for winter and making sure that, yeah, we're doing all those things to warm ourselves up when it's not, you know, happening from the, the sun. So yeah, it's, uh, you know, getting, getting geared up into the next, the next season. That's it. That's it. And it's an exciting, you know, it's an exciting season. There's more time for like, you know, pumpkin pies. And I think that's pretty where the, pretty much where the start and end of the fun uh, is, but you know, um, <laughs> exciting to head into winter. Um, I, my week's been very good. Also, I've had a very busy week this week. I've been working a lot. Um, I've now got a weekend job. So finding free time has become more of a premium than it has been. But uh, for people that were wondering, I've started a job doing basketball court announcing here in uh, Melbourne. So I'm announcing games, which is great because I love basketball. And in fact, for those watching the thing right now, I'm wearing a basketball jumper. Uh, if you want to check out the video there, that's on Spotify. So feel free to head over there. Link's in the description. Um, let's jump into Anna. Now you're a returning guest uh, and uh, people can check you out actually on episode 179. So not even that far. You don't have to have to scroll down that far where we were talking about uh, optimism. Uh, but Anna, for people that maybe, you know, for the first time they're jumping in, uh, do you want to tell us just a little bit about yourself before we jump into today's conversation and a new book that keen-eyed viewers would be able to notice already? <laughs> Yes, yeah, sure. So I am a speaker, author, coach on thriving workplaces. So really, I see my job as sharing the latest research and insights that come um, from some incredibly smart uh, people from fields like positive psychology and much more broadly, but all around what leads to better engagement, resilience, well-being, and ultimately performance um, of people, teams, leaders, and, and the systems themselves. So I feel very privileged to do the work that I do, which is yeah, sharing as much as I've learned and know about yeah, what it takes to thrive uh, with organisations um, as well. Amazing. And we're so happy to have you back because one thing we love doing on Magical Learning uh, Podcast is getting people in to talk about their book because we love when people have really honed in on a specific topic and we can really start to break it down. So you're here today to talk about your book, Strong, but do you want to tell us a little bit about what that book's about and kind of what we're looking for in this conversation today? Mm. Well, I guess this book in particular is probably about almost 10 years worth of me trying to study what actually leads to better performance. So when I was working in the corporate sector and when I was actually leading my own team, of course, being in that position, I was trying to understand, well, what motivated them and what actually, uh, you know, helped them achieve their KPIs. Now, we were in a sales function, so obviously a whole lot of what we were responsible for and certainly as me 
as the leader was how do we actually achieve our goals um, and hit our organization's KPIs? Because that's really what sustains a lot of organizations. So since being in that position, I uh, got really curious and wanted the confidence also about what actually leads to better performance in individuals. I think for a lot of us, you know, we we know what motivates us as individuals, but when all of a sudden, you know, you're put in that leadership position and it's about actually driving other people's behaviour, um, it can be a bit of a struggle. Well, it certainly was um, for me. So that's when um, I got curious and I started exploring and reading and having chats with people trying to understand, well, Surely if organisations have existed for centuries, we're going to have to have some answers somewhere. Like we can't all just be reinventing the wheel. Um, that led me to do further study, including, um, you know, uh, short courses and a master's in positive psychology. And really what I identified is that often our focus is on teaching people skills. So sometimes the technical stuff, um, you know, how do you influence and persuade and negotiate and a lot of those really um, technical skills that are really important in our roles. But what I was noticing from the research I was doing, the conversations I was having, um, case studies I was exploring, et cetera, was that really what came out on top as more important than skills or in addition to skills was that we actually need um, a, a particular mindset and a tool set to be able to achieve long-term sustainable performance. So that's a lot of the principles that I talk about in the book. I use the analogy of focusing on the off-field factors to help set us up for our best uh, performance on-field. So very much it's about how do we achieve better results, but also what I'm teaching in the book is how do you actually help your people or the people around you be more engaged, be more resilient, be more well, which is ultimately going to um, achieve better results for the team, but then the organization overall as well. Wow. There's a lot to break down there. I'm so happy we've got all these questions. Um, I think without further ado, I think we better just jump into this. I think a great place actually to start is John's question um, because John, I think that there's a, little, there's a little bit of a sort of underpinning of a lot more of this conversation. So John, what was your question and why'd you pick it? Hey Anna, how are you going? Yeah, basic question. What's, like your book's based around that positive psychology. What is it? What is positive psychology? Because my slant would probably be very different. Ooh, well, I'll be intrigued to ask you what your slant is, John, soon. Um, but positive psychology uh, is a new field. So it's only been around since, uh, you know, around the year 2000. And really it is the study of what, uh, leads to thriving individuals, teams, leaders, organisations, communities, systems. So what helps each of those things to be at their best? Now, this differs from traditional psychology, which many of us will be more familiar with, which actually studies sort of what's wrong with those things, what's wrong with people or organisations or teams, etc. So it's about helping, you know, cure those, um, those struggles, if you will. What happened is that uh, in around the year 2000 is a clinical psychologist who was leading the American Psychological Association at the time actually challenged um, his peers to say, well, we've learned a whole lot about, you know, mental illness and what leads to suffering. And because of a lot of the research that's been done, we're actually in a fortunate position that we do have a lot of cures and strategies to be able to get people um, to be well. But that was only part of the picture. It sort of helped people maybe move from more of that negative state to kind of that neutral state. But the challenge was put out around well, what actually leads people to the positive end of the spectrum. So what leads people to flourish? What helps people to get to an 8, 9, 10 out of 10? And that um, has actually been a field that's been neglected. Um, since the turn, or since basically the outcomes of World War II, a lot of the investment and research did go into psychology, but at the expense of, you know, learning more about what helps people, um, you know, to be at their best. So positive psychology has been very much embraced by the education system. So Australia is the leader when it comes to positive education. 
So that means our children in both the primary and secondary school settings are actually already learning a whole lot of these concepts, which is really cool. The other area where uh, we hear and see a lot of these principles being applied is in our sports. So a lot of our AFL clubs, cricket, the Socceroos, um, Matildas, um, our swimmers, they are talking a lot about a lot of these concepts as well, which are helping them off field to be better on field. We're also seeing uh, attention um, for these elements in our workplaces as well. And that's obviously the space that I play in. And I think there's a lot more that we can be doing there as well. All right, beauty, thank you. Does that speak to your slant or was it slightly different, John? I, well, I guess my slant was looking at, okay, that positive reinforcement, how do we, you know, where does that sit? But you're, you're also talking, it's more about the, the flourishing, as you said. Um, of the individual and the team within the indi sorry the individual within the team as well, um, and I guess the, the question that's come up for me now is, the, you talked about schools and we give everyone a participation award, but it's more than that, yeah, yeah. And, and it's probably not that. <laughs> Good. I've been having a few conversations about that um, with people because part of this is actually being resilient. So it's actually not dismissing challenges and going, oh, don't worry, it's all butterflies and rainbows out there because that's not reality. So it's actually <laughs> no, about it's how do we have the tactics and the strategies to be able to overcome those challenges and potentially actually come out of them much stronger than we were going in. So it probably wouldn't support the participation medal. It's more about, you know, there will be failures. How do we see them as learnings and opportunities to grow and develop in some way instead? Okay. No, that's really cool. I like that. Thank you. Mm, good. <laughs> yeah, amazing. And a great, uh, a great little convo there as well. Thanks for that second question, John, because I feel like that cracked open a slightly different conversation, but I feel like another good one to have. Uh, let's throw over to Danette. Danette, what was your question and why did you pick it today? I picked two, but... Anna sort of answered the first one, which was what inspired you to write your book. Um, and Anna and I started together, basically, at one stage writing our books. Um, so it's been a lovely journey for the both of us to sort of go from ideas through to completion, which I think is pretty amazing. So maybe I'd change that first question a little bit about um, yeah, how did you apply this to your actual writing of the book? So you've had 10 years' worth of research and and that to get to the book. I'm curious, what did you learn and, and what helped you to be able to get to the completion, Anna? Mm. I think my biggest learning has been that there are these consistent elements that seem to come up when we talk about high-performing people, individuals or leaders. And so that's a lot of what um, I noticed about what I was learning is that there were these consistencies. And so this is what I wanted to share. So... I wanted to give leaders, perhaps some like me, who didn't know what they were meant to do when they became a leader, I wanted to give them almost like a playbook of like, what, what can you go and do? What can you go and follow as really clear, actionable steps um, that have been shown to work for others um, that lead to some of those really great outcomes? So for me, it was, a, it was a way of actually helping others be confident in their leadership because maybe like me, they just want to be told like what it is you need to go and do rather than just guessing. Um, so that was probably that, that first part. But I think, you know, in terms of the writing itself, you know, I see this also as another way of delivering these messages. So, you know, I speak on the topic, I train on the topic, I coach on the topic, but this is another way that, um, that people have access to this information. So people that might not be able to get access in one of those different um, modes. Uh, what I'm loving at the moment, um, maybe it shouldn't have come of a surprise, but you know, people are reading it <laughs> and they're resonating with it. Um, and what I'm loving is that people are reaching out. Um, you know, I'll get an email in my inbox saying, I've just finished this chapter, I'm loving this section, um, or I've just finished this book, this is what I've learned. And, you know, I turn up to workshops and people have done it as a pre-read or certainly once I leave um, training sessions, they've got something to follow on with as well. So I think it's just that additional, um, you know, level 
of learning that I can give to others, you know, uh, in, in this particular format. So, yeah, I, I, I've loved that and I love that, I'm, that, that, you know, people are absolutely resonating with it. I love that answer. And so my second question, because I always like to, because I'm totally curious, is what's one surprising thing that you learnt um, as you were writing your book? So was there a, a thing where the research and you're like, oh, I never thought of it that way or something? Probably so many things. And, you know, given what I was writing about, I probably had to, you know, uh, take a bit of my own um, medicine, if you will, you know, it's it's a labour of love, Danette, as you know, lots of blood, sweat and tears um, are invested into this, not to mention the time that you take away from, you know, some of the other aspects of your life to actually write this. So for me, I had to, you know, when times were tough and when it did feel, um, you know, labour intensive and like you were so deep, you didn't know when you were ever going to get out of it and have a finished product, I, I had to keep coming back to why am I doing this? Like, what was my reason um, who am I doing this for? And that was really what drove me. So at the end of the day, it was so much about yeah, sharing these lessons with more and more people, which is very much what sits um, within my purpose and kind of the lens that I see hopefully most of the things that I do in my life through as well. So, yeah, I think it was about, yeah, learning that it's going to be tough, but coming back to why you're doing it. Love that answer. And I love that strength of your purpose and your why because it, it is, I suppose, I've definitely seen it and I'm sure you've seen it as well, when people don't have that, mm -hmm. it's much harder to dig deep when it's tough and stuff like that. So anyway, I'm looking forward to the answers to the other questions too. So thank you, Anna. Yeah, amazing. Um, yeah, thanks for those uh, conversations. So so good. Um, let's jump right into Graham's question here because this is starting to get into a little bit more of the nuts and bolts a little bit. So uh, Graham's question here is, how does our ability to quickly build relationships influence our success in sales? Uh, this is definitely something I've noticed as well. So uh, yeah, uh, I guess I'm going to throw it over to you, Anna. <laughs> thank you. And thank you to Graham for that one. I think first things first, uh, relationship building doesn't have to be quick, okay? So I think... When it does come to sales, you know, certainly from that long-term sustainable performance perspective, this is actually about re building relationships that are deep and they probably do take more time because you want to really get to know um, the person that you're working with. Now, relationships are absolutely fundamental um, when it comes to sales particularly and the relationships that we have with our clients because ultimately that's where we, we get the sale. So they are incredibly important for us. But what's really interesting is that we often don't give enough focus or attention to the relationships around us because they are just as important for our success as well. So really, I like to challenge people, yes, about the relationships you might have with your clients, but also think about the quality of the relationships that you have with your team. So are you actually, you know, part of um, a, a team that supports one another? Are you supporting them and vice versa? Do you feel valued and heard and respected as well? And that also extends to other stakeholders that might be in your network. So certainly across the organisation, but then even thinking about, you know, industry connections as well. For human beings, you know, if there was one element that was the most important for us to feel good and function well um, and to be successful, it's, it's our relationships. Like we would not have survived as a species without them um, and we need them still these days to help us get through tough times. It's actually a strategy that resilient people use is drawing on the support of others. So they certainly help us um, from a survival perspective. But then what we also know is that our relationships contribute to a lot of the good times that we have. So they are where we experience a lot of joy and we celebrate and we're happy. Um, a lot of those moments are shared with others. So they're also big contributors to our well-being more generally. So relationships, yeah, there's sort of a lot of depth to them more um, in a sales perspective, not just with that client, um, but also thinking about, you know, the networks that we're creating around us. And here I don't want people just thinking about the quantity we've really got to think about what's the quality of those connections that we have because the higher the quality, the more benefits that we're going to get out of them.
Awesome. Well, let's jump into our next question here. Um, and I think this I'm just going to jump to my question here uh, because it's a, a skill that I've always been quite bad at, which is just sort of selling and upselling. Um, what are some tips for people like me who struggle with s- selling items or sort of, you know, being in that selling space? Well, firstly, Jess, I don't think you're bad at selling <laughs> because I think you, you've already probably sold to us, um, you know, throughout this conversation already. I think we need to reframe that idea of selling sometimes. I mean, you know, we there's a bit of the ickiness around it when we talk about sales and selling. I'm very much of the philosophy that everyone is in sales. So even when I talk to teachers or doctors or lawyers or priests even I was talking to the other day, you know, everyone is, um, you know, typically exchanging value with another. Um, so that is that process of selling. So I think the first thing is like reframing that idea of what selling is. But the second is probably just breaking it down to, um, you know, how can you help someone with their challenges or their problems? So what are the problems that someone has and how can you solve them? Because that is really very much the fundamentals of selling is um, if you've got something that they need and you know that, then that should be, a, you know, there should be that fair exchange of value of that. So I'm hoping, Jez, that might be some tips around, yeah, how we can, you know, get all of us get better at selling, but make it a much easier process as well. Mm. Yeah, no, I think uh, that does, that is probably a good idea because a lot of, I think the places where I was taught to sell, I knew I was selling bad items to people. So I had this sort of moral problem of having a, where I'm like, I am being told my, by my boss to upsell, but I know that this person can't afford it and they shouldn't buy it. You know, mm-hmm. um, these, obviously this is, you know, at old retail jobs and what have you. Um, but yeah, anyways, I think that could maybe, maybe I think just flipping that to like, people actually could use what I can sell and it's not as greasy as what you're talking about. So I'm definitely taking away a lot from there. Um, let's jump into Marg's question. So what if, so I think Marg's is a great question to bounce off of this because, uh, say you, you're actually going well with your sales. Marg's question is, what are some tips for continuing to maintain your KPI growth? Mm, very good. Well, I think first and foremost, uh, you know, we fail to sometimes recognize and consider like what are the things that we're actually doing well? So if you're already um, on a good trajectory, you know, towards KPI growth, let's stop and pause and reflect on well, what are you already doing well? Like what is it that you're doing that's actually helping you achieve that growth? Because so often we go, you know, chasing, well, what are we not doing well and where are my gaps and what could I, you know, fix and make better? But, you know, if, if the growth is already there, let's actually consider, well, let, how do we build on that? How do we build on that strength? That probably speaks a little bit to the question that we're just talking about with that upselling perspective is often we chase new clients and we try and actually think about new industries or new opportunities that we might have But I think we fail to neglect sometimes, well, what about the existing relationships that we've already got? So similar to that upsell, maybe not in the um, products that you don't want other people to have, but if, if people have already bought from you, is there an opportunity for you to offer more to them, to help them solve more of their challenges by offering, you know, more products or more services? They might not actually be aware of the other things that you have on offer, So it's always important to, um, you know, explore that with them. And if they've already got that relationship with you, it's going to be much easier to sell in that way. In addition to that, I think a lot of us also uh, fail to ask for referrals. So again, if you've already got someone that has experienced you and has enjoyed the relationship that they've built with you, there might be potential for them to know other people that need your services. But so often we don't actually ask people for referrals or ask them to think of other people that they might be able to refer you to or you might be able to, you know, have a conversation with them. Again, just like our professional service providers like our doctors or our physios or all those other ones, you know, we so often rely on referrals. Um, You know, if your GP tells you to go to a specialist, you don't typically double check it. You just go because they've told you. So can we be establishing those sorts of relationships with Um, other people in our network or potentially those existing clients as well. I think they are some um, clear 
potentially easier opportunities for us to explore for that continued growth as opposed to, you know, just going hunting for, for new clients. Yeah. Wow. Great insights there. And, you know, it almost seems obvious when you say it, but, uh, uh, it, as I was saying, it almost seems uh, obvious when you say it, uh, but um, but reconnecting with old good clients makes total sense and establishing pathways that can be beneficial is, it makes so much sense when you say it, I just hadn't thought of it. Um, let's jump into Kanika's question here, which is, what are some tips for freelancers who want to develop some of their sales skills? I know a lot of people my age are sort of dipping into the freelance world and you know, maybe they have a skill as a um, you know, video editor, but they don't fully understand how to get that message out to people. So um, what might be a way for them to approach uh, yeah, this sort of realm? Well, you know, I think, again, this probably comes back to some of the challenges that we all have, which is, you know, selling yourself. You know, sometimes when it is a product or a service, it can be much easier than actually um, selling you. So, again, I would come back to, you know, what is the, um, the challenge that you're, you're solving for other people? So even as a freelancer who might be offering that specific service, well, how does that help others and who are the people that actually need your help? So that's where I'd be getting yeah, very clear on like, what's your value proposition? What are the challenges you solve? And who are the sorts of people that you can solve those challenges for? And then start having those you know, conversations with those sorts of people or finding people that can introduce you um, to those people would certainly be you know, on top of my list, I would say first and foremost. Amazing, amazing. I think that's a good tip as well uh, for all freelancers. Um, all right, let's jump into the, I, I guess I wanted to save this question for the end because I think it could be a good one to kind of mop up some of the things that we may not have covered in the conversation. So Alan's question is, what are some of the key principles you talk about in your book? But I guess, Anna, I also wanted you to utilize this time for anything that we haven't really t like scratched the surface on that's in your book. Are there any key things that we've missed out as well in this conversation? Well, we've already covered a lot in a, in a very short space of time. I guess it's just a reminder that some of those um, skills that, you know, we have focused so much on are only part of the story. So some of those traditional technical skills, um, you know, when we're talking about better performance, only get us, you know, part of the way. In this particular day and age where we are part of some incredibly complex environments where we've got, you know, constant market changes, um, there's less resources around, we've got more pressure to do our job, our clients are constantly changing and have different expectations, the skills will only get us so far. So we really need to be thinking about, well, what's the mindset that I need to not only survive this environment, but actually thrive in it? Our last conversation was around optimism. So that is very much what this book talks about. The O of strong stands for optimism because that really is um, the mindset that all of us need certainly to thrive personally, but the majority of us need who are in any of those sales, customer-facing roles need, um, you, you know, to be optimistic. It can differ for some particular industries, but largely I'm going to say that optimism is going to set you up for success. In addition to that, that tool set, again, we've spoken to some of the elements, but we really need to have that toolkit around us to set us up um, for better performance. So this is where I talk about things like playing to your strengths. So our strengths are actually internal resources that we can use to help us be more engaged, to help us overcome our challenges, to also grow and develop and to do better. So these are things that are already lying within us, but for a lot of people, they actually lie dormant. So we need to actually be able to play to those. So that's one of the, the tools that we have at our disposal. What also we need to build is those relationships. So again, as we spoke about, what's those high quality relationships that we have that actually help us um, to be at our best as well? Lastly, what we also need in our toolkit is that motivation. So how are we making sure that we are intrinsically motivated to achieve our goals? Now, for a lot of us, that intrinsic motivation does come from things like feeling competent, also feeling autonomous in our roles, but also having that connection to that purpose. So I spoke a bit about that, about me writing my book, 
But that's also really important in our day-to-day -day jobs and can be something that helps get us through those tough times. So I'm very much wanting to encourage people to think about the skill set that they might have, but don't neglect the mindset and the tool set that you absolutely need um, you know, to be more engaged, to achieve more, and to thrive personally and professionally. So that's a lot of those key principles that are covered in the book. Amazing. Well, we'll get to um, we'll get to that very shortly. The actual book and um, where people can pick it up. But I, before we get there, let's jump into some final thoughts from our team. So I might start with uh, Danette. Danette, any final thoughts on today's conversation? It was such a great conversation, and I really liked that last bit about the skills plus the mindset plus the toolkit. That really sets you up to be strong to be successful. So I really love that. So many other things, but I will let John have a say and Jez as well. Thank you, Anna. It was awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jeanette. Um, John, I'm going to throw over to you now. John, any final thoughts on today's conversation? Yeah, for me, Anna, you know, it reinforced two things primarily for me anyway. It was around the relationships that we have and the quality of them is really important. I remember talking to my kids uh, years ago when they were little, well, the older ones were little, but they, yeah, someone, one of them said, I've got 300 friends on Facebook and, you know, it's like, well, how many of those do you actually know? When are their birthday, you know, you dig deep, yeah, they no idea. So relationships are, and relationships are very important. I, I honestly believe that. The other one is the why am I doing this? And to me, that's that motivation and that's when times get really hard going back to but it's that, yeah, why am I doing this? And it's sort of made me think of, of a couple of things that I've got on outside of all of this, but it's, yeah, okay, forget about that part of it. This is why I'm actually doing it. So, yeah, go back to the, why am I actually doing it? So, thank you. My pleasure. It's a, it's a very good lens, uh, you know, to, to view our life and also should help us, you know, even influence things like our career direction and then what are our goals for the year or for the 10 years, but also what are the everyday actions that we're doing to actually achieve that? And that's how I, I, I view my purpose um, yeah. for those lenses. And looking at, you know, if I want to make a change, asking that, that simple question, you know, do I want to do more exercise or less exercise, say, why am I doing it? You know, what is the motivator behind it? And use that lens, as you said, for everyday tasks, not just the big things that that come up in life. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks to Ned and John for great insights and great questions. I also just wanted to say I loved this conversation because of the combination of sort of zoomed out perspective and right into the sort of uh, sort of detail. So I thought this has been a really good one. I've taken a whole page of notes. I've had a great time. Um, before we get into uh, the actual where people can pick up the book, did you have any final thoughts, Anna, for us uh, on today's conversation? Oh gosh. Well, I'm hoping I'm hoping that people can think about these principles in all different um, aspects of their life. So for you, Jez, you know, thinking about your sporting career, you know, how can this be applied there? Because as I said, a lot of our sports teams are already adopting a lot of um, these principles. John, you mentioned your children. Same thing, you know, we're learning about these elements in sports or in our organisations, but it's thinking about, well, what does that actually look like in the relationships that I have with my children and what I'm teaching them? Um, and even from that, you know, schooling perspective. Um, and Danette, obviously, with the work that you're doing, you know, with leaders and teams, you know, what, what do some of these principles look like applied um, with the incredible work that you do? So it's really, you know, these learnings can just be applied in so many different realms. And that's what I particularly love about some of these principles as well. Yeah, well, me too. I love it as well. So, Anna, people have listened to this. They've gone, I need to pick up this book and I need to reach out to Anna. Where are the best places for those two things to happen? Well, first and foremost, um, please reach out to me via my website, which is annaglim.com.au. That's where you can find links to buy the book, the physical, the uh, ebook, and then also the newly released audio book as well. So, we've got all those different ways that people can actually. Uh, uh, in, will take in this this uh, learning and this writing. Uh, in addition to that, all you know, would love people to connect with me on LinkedIn, where I'm regularly sharing sort of tips and strategies from this space, uh, and would love to hear from anyone to have a further conversation as well. 
Amazing. Well, I'm sure a lot of people are going to jump on and I think that audiobook is fantastic. If you've enjoyed listening to this, then just keep listening. Listen straight on to the book. It's going to be perfect. Um, and I want to thank you so much for being on. We're so happy and excited to be talking about your book today. Danette and John, great questions, um, great conversation. And to everybody that's been sharing and listening, I want to thank you all and have, as always, have a magical week. <laughs>